Today I'll show you a small scale preparation of potassium bromate. Potassium bromate is a strong oxidizing agent, but I'm not going to use it to make any pyrotechnics. Yet there is a reason why I'm making potassium bromate. Firstly, it can be used to make bromine very easily and secondly, I'll make benzylic acid. If you want to know how a bromate cell works, make sure to stay until the very end of this video. For the first test, we are going to need a small pinch of potassium dichromate and a lot of potassium bromide. A stirfish was added to the speaker and we then weighed out about 100 grams of potassium bromide. The amount of distilled water used doesn't really matter, so we ended up filling up the beaker to the 400 milliliter mark. The solution was stirred until all of the potassium bromide dissolved and as we stir it you can see that the potassium bromide solution has a much higher density than the water and it makes this very interesting looking effect. While stirring the potassium dichromate was added and we added even more distilled water. Using two plastic clamps, the electrodes were clamped to a wire and they were put into the solution. The power supply and the magnetic stirrer were turned on and we ran the cell at about 3 volts and a lot of amps. When not stirring and taking a look at the electrodes, you can see that some red stuff is being generated at the right electrode. This is bromine. On the left electrode you can see a gas. This is hydrogen. I let the cell run at about 4.2 volts for an entire week before we came back. If you let a chlorate cell run for too long, you would generate perchlorate. With a bromate cell, we don't have this problem. Normally, fluorine gas is being used to produce perbromate. Therefore, I don't think that there will be any chance that we will generate perbromate with our setup. Once the electrolysis was finished, we were left with this mess. I added a lot of distilled water and we heated it up to dissolve the bromate. A gravity filtration was performed while the solution was still hot and this got rid of all of the contaminants. The leftover solution before the recrystallization was discarded and therefore this bromate should be fairly pure. Another gravity filtration was performed and the bromate was dried in a vacuum desiccator. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Fifty seven point one grams of potassium bromate is unacceptable. We need to make more. For the next step, we are going to use a titanium and an MMO electrode. MMO stands for mixed metal oxides, and apparently titanium and MMO is unsuited for bromate production, but it seemed to work out. Strangely enough, the only container I have which can fit these electrodes perfectly is this beer mug. Never use food containers for doing chemistry. But I'm a German and I don't have another option. This container has been properly labeled and it will never be used for drinking again. This time we used the rest of the bromate, but I started off by adding about 400 grams and adding the rest later on. Instead of using potassium dichromate, it's also possible to use potassium persulfate. Potassium persulfate is much safer. Once the solution was clear, the electrodes were positioned. Apparently bromine and even bromine water will damage the electrodes over time. Therefore stirring was kept up during the entire electrolysis. The container was sealed using clear tape to keep in any splashes. An electric thermocouple was connected because we don't want the temperature to go too high. Ideally we want to keep the temperature between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. Too low temperatures will result in hyperbromates not decomposing fast enough and high temperatures will reduce the lifetime of the electrodes. Steering was turned off and you can see that in comparison to the graphite cell, we produced much more bromine. This is to be expected. The electrodes have a larger surface area and the current can be higher. Over time the current was raised, but I didn't let the temperature of the cell go above 62 degrees Celsius. To maintain a high current density while not allowing the solution to get too hot, it was occasionally placed into a bucket of water. 24 hours later. The next day a lot of crystals have already separated out. You can see that some of them settled on an electrode because overnight the solution cooled down way too much. The contents of the electrolysis cell were poured into this large beaker. Afterwards the solution was poured back into the electrolysis cell leaving this powder behind. This cycle was repeated at least 4 times followed by adding fresh bromide. The old connection between wire and electrode got so hot that I nearly burned my fingers. To avoid this fire hazard, I switched out the connection and now it's safe. You can see that the old wire connection even has some burn marks. Bromate crystallized out, was removed from the electrolysis cell and was replaced by adding fresh bromide. 
I read on Science Madness that making bromate this way basically eats the electrodes alive. Either my electrodes are different or I'm just lucky, but we let the cell run for 7 days and they still look exactly the same. This is the last bit of bromate that crystallized out of this cancerous beer. Now have a look at all of that bromate that we collected. Now we're talking. The potassium chlorate from the previous run got contaminated with a very small amount of calcium chlorate and therefore I added it to this recrystallization. At room temperature potassium bromate has a poor solubility of just 69 grams per liter. In boiling water it's 500 grams. Recrystallizing potassium bromate to clean it up is exceedingly easy. In comparison to potassium bromide it's 10 times less soluble at the same temperature. At 25 degrees celsius a liter of water dissolves 680 grams of potassium bromide. We have to stir manually at the beginning because there's so much solid in there that the stirfish isn't able to swim. As we wanted to monitor the temperature, a thermocouple was hooked up. The moment the stirfish started stirring, everything became easier. More and more water was added because the potassium bromate wouldn't dissolve. I was very lucky, the 2 liter beaker could fit just enough water to dissolve all of the solid. The moment the solution was clear, heating and stirring were turned off and we only had to wait for crystals to form. If you're wondering, this time lapse was filmed over the course of about 4 hours. The crystal mass didn't increase, but because the crystals are bigger, there's more water in between them and therefore it looks like we got more potassium bromate than we started with. Once the solution reached a temperature of about 25 degrees celsius, most of the potassium bromate had crystallized out. The fastest way to get rid of the water is a vacuum filtration, so I set up my big vacuum filtration setup. While doing this the oil filter of my pump exploded. I need to replace this pump eventually. If you're interested, check out the link in the description to join my Patreon. The pump spit out a lot of oil, but I needed to finish this vacuum filtration one way or another. To get rid of leftover potassium bromate, the filter cake was washed one time using distilled water. The still wet bromate was scraped into a plastic tray, which was then put into my vacuum desiccator over an hydrous calcium chloride. More potassium bromate crashed out after the filtration, but it's not a lot and I prioritize purity over yield. All contaminated solutions were collected. They still contain a lot of potassium bromate and a lot of potassium bromate and we are going to recover bromine from it. A vacuum desiccator is superior to a normal desiccator or air drying. It's so much faster. After evacuating it took 3 days until the product was completely dry. In order to weigh it, it was transferred onto a small watch glass. After recrystallizing and drying, our product had a beautiful white color with no tint of yellow. I didn't pass the 500 gram mark, but we still collected a lot of product, which was then transferred to a properly labeled storage container. And there you go, homemade potassium bromate. Let's drop half a gummy bear in the potassium bromate. This wouldn't happen with bromate and it therefore proves that we made bromate. Let's take a deep dive into the inner workings of a bromate cell. In the overall scheme of things we can say that potassium bromate reacts with 3 water molecules to form potassium bromate and 3 hydrogen. In reality the reaction is much more difficult. The darker electrode is the anode. As you saw earlier in the video, bromine water was produced at this electrode. On the titanium electrode however, hydrogen gas was liberated and hydroxy ions were generated. The bromine then reacts with hydroxy ions to form bromides, hyperbromide and water. You can see this reaction right here. For now you see the red color of the bromine and upon stirring it immediately fades away. Hyperbromide is not stable at normal temperatures and immediately decomposes to form bromides and bromate. As we already saw, potassium bromate is poorly soluble and crashes out of solution. If you liked today's video make sure to like and subscribe and if you really liked it please consider becoming a Patreon because otherwise I won't be able to continue making videos that frequently. And to my already existing Patreons, thank you guys, I really appreciate it.